Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can uh, begin uh, anyway. So, uh, what I will uh, talk about then is um, the e krona monetary reform and so on, what we are all here for. And um, first question is then, why an e krona? And there is a uh, lot of different arguments put forward to that. And um, the Riksbank, who is the one who has been uh, initiated the debate about e krona in Sweden, they are not into um, uh, monetary reform of any kind or narrow banking, Chicago plan or anything. They have a set of different objectives. And um, the first objective is that you should have um, accessibility to uh, payment, payment system for everyone. That is, if cash become uh, less and less uh, common, less and less uh, available to use, then um, you will, um, uh, some people may have problems accessing the payment system. And uh, that is totally correct. The problem with that argument is that e krona will do nothing to solve that. It will not be easier for a person uh, who may be uh, uh, maybe is blind or have very little sight to use an e-krona than another, uh, than the current system, for example. And I could go on and on about why, uh, and I will not, but uh, maybe I will soon. Maybe I will soon. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the. Great. Yeah. Sorry. So, no problem. No problem. So, so just I will not go through this, but this is just some of the po potential problems that uh, you can have access accessing the payment system. And here we have what the banks have done. And then is what could the e-krona do? I mean, what? How would it in practice? Uh, uh, improve things for people who have problems assessing, accessing the payment system. And uh, the Riksbank has said nothing about that, but still claims that uh, this is an important uh, reason for e krona. Uh, then another, another reason for the e krona is that uh, it could increase competition. And here the idea is that the payment system is uh, very much interconnected. There is, uh, for example, only one uh, mass clearing institute in Sweden, Bankirot, where uh, all the clearing of payment goes through, more or less. And that is, of course, a monopoly. And then you could say, oh, that's not good. And the thing is that it is well known it's a monopoly, and therefore it has been regulated for a long time, the bankier are not allowed to uh, turn down anyone who wants to be part of this system, and it is not allowed to uh, set prices so high that they make ex excess profits. So yes, there is a potential problem, and uh, it has been taken care of in the same way that uh, we do with many other utilities, that we regulate, reg regulate it. And then there is um, the reason that Riksbank is interested in robustness of the payment system. And uh, uh, this is also something that is important. I mean, um, the things could happen and we are very dependent on the payment system. And uh, therefore, it is good to have a resilient system. And it might be a good idea to have some parallel infrastructure so say that uh, if something happens with the current infrastructure, we have another infrastructure we could use instead. Uh, as someone was saying before, it's not sure uh, that this is the that having a parallel infrastructure is the best way of increasing uh, robustness. But it's um, it could be. I mean, it's uh, and this is also something that people work on. But it's an, it, this is really an important issue, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the banks are also very interested in uh, having a robust system. 
And uh, I think that the thing is that if, if we want to go for parallel infrastructure, if we think that that is the way we should go, then it doesn't really have anything to do with an e-krona. You could have that with or without an e-krona. So it's a totally separate question. And I think it's a good thing that uh, the e-krona project have put some a spotlight on the robustness issue, but I don't think it's very much of a reason for an e-krona. Uh, but then we move into say that the more of sovereign money, money monetary reform movement, they say that okay, e krona, it could be a step towards sovereign money. And I think uh, that that is, uh, I mean, that's a correct analysis. I mean, if you want to move to a sovereign money system, the e krona would be a step towards that. What does a sovereign money system mean? It means that we have a government-run, uh, government-run deposits, and that, that we ban private banks from having deposits, uh, on-demand deposits. So, I think um, that if you want a sovereign money system, then you should. Yeah, this is a step forward. So it will be easier to do this in two steps: first, e krona, and then. Uh, then uh, forbid the banks to take on on site deposits, and then of course the question is: Is the sovereign money system better, or worse than the system we have? And here I think um, uh, I very much agree with Dirk Nippelt that you could implement this in a way that it will be alike, very much alike, almost as the same as the system today. So it doesn't have to change very much. And I think also that uh, uh, Lars Aleus, your, your presentation also showed that it could be done in a way that things run along like it do today, but uh, we have e-kronas and the, uh, the Riksbank lend money to the banks and uh, the, the public lends money to the Riksbank. And, uh, but things, if you would, change that. Of course, it wouldn't be very much of a problem, but not very much of a point with it either. I mean, it will be more or less the same if you do it in that way. And I think that, well, before I go into pros and cons of sovereign, of changing into an e-krona in a way that is the same as we have now, I think it's a very important point that we have been talking about a bit earlier today, that if you set the interest rate, you implicitly set how much uh, money there will be circulating in the economy. So you could do that. That is what the central bank does today. Uh, in principle, it couldn't say, say, OK, we will regulate the amount of money that is around in the economy, the quantity of uh, on money, and uh, then that would uh, we would use that to set the interest rate, and that uh, that would imply that we have a certain interest rate. So I mean that is not an issue; that is just a practical issue, which which is the easiest thing to aim for. And regardless of that, you have uh, to say that if you have a too expansionary policy, that you uh, say, print too much money or have a too low interest rate, you will get uh, too high inflation. And if you have a uh, too uh, strict monetary <coughs> policy, then you will have a slowdown economy and uh, unnecessary unemployment. So whatever system you have, if you go for the uh, quantities or for the interest rate, you are you will always have to aim for uh, full employment and a stable uh, low inflation. And uh, uh, so I think that is not really very much of an issue. So let's say now that we would like to go to an e-krona. <laughs> and uh, what do we have to do? What could go wrong if we implement an e-krona and uh, we want not to have any problems with it? Well, 
one thing is that if you have an e-krona without the possibility to have a negative interest rate, uh, then we will lose one uh, important uh, uh, one important way to keep the economy on track, and that will uh, uh, lead to increased unemployment. That's not good. And uh, uh, but that's that is so obvious. I mean, if you go for an e krona and they say we will not allow a negative interest rate, we will just accept higher unemployment. Uh, I mean, it's not very likely that policymakers will go for that option, I think. But uh, you should always be aware that sometimes things happen in uh, politics, sometimes it goes fast. Uh, but so that this would be really a big problem, uh, but hopefully uh, it won't happen. The other thing is that if we have a lot of e-kronas, if it becomes very popular, the Riksbank will get a lot of deposits. And uh, of course, they have to do something with their deposits. And uh, uh, you could, that the Riks Bank uh, could uh, lend it on to banks or it could lend it on to the public. And then, if you lend it on to the public, uh, will you get the money back if you lend it to the public? I mean, then you have to make your credit risk assessments and so on. And uh, I think this is. Um, <coughs> Uh, this is something that uh, the Riksbank uh, has no experience of. It hasn't done that for 100 years. Uh, there are no people in the Riksbank who are competent in that area. Uh, it's not unlikely that the politicians maybe would think that, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, lend money to those guys that they like and not to the other one who we do not like and don't care too much about the credit risk. And who will pay for the credit losses, of course, the taxpayers. Uh, so you have to be sure that you uh, treat the deposit that you have in a good way, that you don't lose all your money. And then there is one point of, uh, let's say the point of why do we have deposits at all? Why do people like to have deposits? Uh, well, it's convenient, it's good to have uh, money available on demand. On the other hand, if you borrow money, then it's very nice to, that no one can come and say, well, I would like my money back now. Well, I have bought a house for the money. Uh, I can't give you money back. Okay, but uh, so the people who lend the money, they want to uh, have access to it immediately. And the ones who borrow the money want to have a long-term loan. And it turns out that if you have this maturity transformation that you have on-site deposits, uh, then uh, you can use those for long-term loans. But as you all know, this is potentially unstable. But if you can manage it, you will really help people who want to buy a house, for example, to finance their house. So. It has a value, an economic value, that you can do maturity transformation. But uh, if you do it uh, recklessly, then you end up with problems. And if you forbid it totally, then you will uh, have a much harder time financing things that people value to have financed. So, and that leaves us, I think, that Okay, so we have a popular e-krona, and we get all, the, all this money to the Riksbank. Uh, what should we do with the money? We, we will have to have some type, type of decision. How much maturity transformation shall we do in the Riksbank? And um, so we still have the same questions about credit risk. This is technical, I'll skip it. Uh, and um, we still have the same problems as we had before. How much uh, of credit maturity transformation, how much of credit risk can we accept? Uh, and so I think uh, that moving to e it will not change anything of this, but it will 
open up for some risks that something goes wrong in the change of system. Uh, and um, that will, um, so I would say that it is safer to work within this, this current system and uh, try to keep it strict so you don't have too much maturity and transformation that you have, strict regulation and capital and so on. And uh, I mean, obviously it was too little regulation before the great financial crisis. And uh, it's, it's a balancing act and you can't, you can't get away from it just by introducing e-krona. And uh, you can't, um, you can get rid of the problems if you don't allow for any credit, but uh, then you will not be able to buy houses, you will not be able to save money for your retirement. I mean, it's complicated, uh, and I think it's a very interesting discussion, but I think that the main issues will remain the same, even if you go for an e-krona. Thank you, zero minutes.